Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real pleasure to introduce you the next speaker, uh, Michael Hofer. So firstly, I would like to tell you a story behind, behind this. Two months ago, I saw a video uh, from Michael how to turn pharmaceutical drug. And I was, I was shocked. I sent the link to this video to all my friends. And some other uh, friends also sent me this link. Uh, <laughs> And so I'm not sure if you, if you saw this video, but anyway, uh, when, I, when, I f when I finished like, watching this video, I realized that thanks to a guy like Michael, the pharmaceutical companies, they could lose monopoly over like a creation of drugs, any, basically any, any drugs. And personally, I think this is like the vision to our future, and I'm really happy that uh, Michael accepted our invitation. So welcome here, Michael. Thank you so much. And thank you all for having me. It's been great being here. Um, I've seen a lot of really fascinating talks, and it's great to be at a conference where philosophy plays a greater role um, than the technical side, or they at least have parity. Um, oftentimes I go to places and, and I get barrages of technical questions and there's, there's very little about the philosophy and the politics that go on behind what we do. So for those of you who don't uh, know the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective, um, I'm the chief spokesman and what we do is we develop open source technologies that allow people to do DIY versions of both medicines and medical technologies of various sorts. Um, so after seeing so many talks that were philosophical in nature, I retooled my talk to talk specifically more about the philosophy and to dial back the technical things. Now, for those of you who do have technical interests or questions about how we do things, I have added a little bit, and I will, of course, answer any questions that anybody has specifically. Um, and uh, specifically, I don't know if he's here, but a big shout-out to Smuggler, who is very... Um, inspiring to watch his talk, and I lifted a little bit from his talk, so if you're here, Smuggler, and I got anything wrong, I apologize. My memory's a little shaky. Um, so, first of all, just why we've all come here. There's this thread that seems to connect everybody, that there are these institutions and systems that we didn't ask to become part of. Um, Statehood. Uh, I carry a U.S. passport, but I didn't ask to be a U.S. citizen. I'm stuck with that. And if I want to travel, I have to accept that somehow or fight very, very hard. Um, and similarly, in places outside of this wonderful little island, I have to use fiat currency if I want to trade. Um, the food infrastructure, if you don't have some micro system of growing your own food or live on a farm, you're going to have a difficult time not trading for it. Um, and similarly, systems of law. And, and over the past few days, it's been so cool to see people suggesting systems that run in parallel. And to remember that wonderful quote by Buckminster Fuller, it's easier to build a system that makes the old system obsolete than to fight a system head-on. Of course, you know, fighting the system head-on the traditional way, it's viscerally satisfying and there's some romance to it. Um, and while these sorts of moments can sometimes feel like a win, seems like it would be nice to not have to do that. And again, I see this over and over in everybody's talks saying, you know, we can find a way to bypass these without having to go into these, these terrible fights that are so necessary. So another thing that, that I appreciated so much from Smuggler's talk was that he was talking about definitions. And definitions are critical because so often when engaging in a political discourse or a philosophical discourse, there's this circularity of the discussion. Things don't go anywhere. And it's because the terms haven't been properly defined first. And, um, and, and he had this very interesting model that he threw up about the idea of rulership. And this was his flowchart. Uh, his flowchart was similar. This is my bastardization of his flowchart. 
And his discussion of anarchy is that traditionally, what you have is you have the abolishment of punishment. Those actors which can enact the punishment are removed, and so rulership is removed. And in the crypto structure, instead what you're doing is you're obfuscating the possibility of observation and attribution, which similarly breaks the structure of this cycle, which I thought was really fascinating to look at. And given his interesting definition, to which some people took exception, of what crypto anarchy is, I'd be interested to th know which of you think maybe we fall into this category, maybe we only fall into this category very recently. So, talking about definitions, there's this definition that Smuggler gave that was very specific and based on the structure of the English word, talking about the absence of rulership. Now, while that is correct and we decide what our definition should be, alternately, most people use the word anarchy in a more sort of ad hoc way. And the typical use definition basically centers around this idea of trying to obfuscate systems of oppression. We feel oppressed. We'd like to not. We feel forced into participating in things that we'd rather not. And somehow, we want a way out. And anarchy is sort of the catch-all term that we tend to use uh, to describe this. But the danger of defining anything is that anything you use within a definition has to be defined. What is oppression? And again, there's a proper definition. So here's what appears in the Oxford English Dictionary. And this is fine, but, you know, not very useful. And again, the question is, what do we think of oppression as being? So, again, there's also a use definition that seems very typical, which is you're being coerced into some sort of action or participation in something which you'd rather not. And, and I know that sounds very uh, privileged to be like, oh, it's not my favorite thing. Oh, I just don't want to do the thing that's not my favorite. Uh, but it's more than that. Oftentimes, people are disenfranchised from access to services, access to financial institution access to firearms, access to food, access to medicine. And medicine is the one where we fall in. And again, the concept of opting out is another theme that I've seen over and over this weekend, this idea, can we just say, look, I don't want to destroy your system, I just don't want to play. And yet, your system might have some things that I want, but I don't want to interface with the structure that you forced on it. So how do we go about that? Again, there's this danger when we set up parallel systems, is it progress? And there's a great danger that I see happening and that we at the Fourth East Vinegar Collective are working very hard to try to not to fall into. Um, looking at oppression, what is the structure that typically shows up? Well, there's a control of some sort of resource, access to something. Again, banking services, manufacturing, and that comes from information control, always. What allows you access to resources? The understanding of how that works. And this goes to a further layer. That information is only a commodity if it's shrouded somehow, when you force it to become a commodity. And the only way that that's possible is when the understanding of that conceptual idea has been buried. And this happens all the time. And it's so dangerous, especially with things which are technical in nature, which are the workarounds that we tend to develop. So if we build some wonderful workaround, but it has a technical aspect that's not accessible to people, we're going to end up in what I call the de-skilling cycle. So there's a barrier to access. Somehow, there's something that people want or need, and they don't have free access or the access is not as free as they would like or we would like. And so typically, as sort of techno enthusiasts, we find some clever workaround. And typically it's a technological thing and we manage to bridge the gap. And we feel really great about that. But because it's technical, for the people who are not technical, there needs to be something to allow them to utilize that. And so it becomes institutionalized after it becomes popular. Bitcoin's a great example, 3D printing's a great example, and it goes on. And once it's popularized, then institutions grow up around it. And here's where the danger starts. 
because as soon as it's institutionalized, you're back where you started. I remember distinctly uh, a makerspace that I was part of at one point. Um, uh, one of the members, he came to pick me up in his car, and he's on the phone, and he was really angry. And I said, what do you, what's, what's wrong? And he said, I've been on tech support hold with MakerBot for two and a half hours. And I thought, well, we've lost. <laughs> it's over. The whole point was we were no longer reliant on infrastructure, and here we are, we've just supplanted one infrastructure for another. What are we doing? That's not progress. Maybe it's a different institution, maybe it's one we hate less, maybe it's one we like better, maybe we like what it stands for, but still there's, there's a problem. So the way out of this is twofold. First off, we need to, instead of building in these fixes, we need to build in ways that people can have genuine understanding. We want to empower people not by saying, hey, I brought you something, but saying, hey, I'm going to show you how you can go out and get it yourself. Whenever I give interviews, interviewers always ask me, is there anything else you'd like to add? And I say, well, yeah. Our great goal is to no longer exist. We'd like to not be necessary anymore. We'd like our technology to make its way into the open source community and be another tool that people are picking up and using as they see fit. That way, we are not leveraging the technology and saying, hey, everybody, go out and use it. It's, it's there. It's usable if you want. Not if you don't want. And I think that that's, that strategy may, I hope, proof us from that danger of the de-skilling cycle where all of a sudden it just ends up that, yes, people can manufacture their own pharmaceuticals, but they're calling up you know, Four Thieves hotline saying, hey, you know, my, my Daraprim didn't come out right. Can you help me? And instead, people are at home and they're innovating on their own. They're building things on their own. They're utilizing the technology in ways we hadn't thought of. They're developing new medicines that nobody's created before. They're utilizing the technology in ways we hadn't imagined. They're creating medicine we hadn't thought was possible. That's what we hope for. Looking at all the various things, the access to these various institutions and, and tools, health often gets short shrift which is unfortunate because we think of it last. Because, of course, if you're denied your health in the most extreme case, you're denied your life. But in the less extreme cases, if you're just very ill, you're not denied your life, but you are denied the thing that allows life to be meaningful. Anybody who's been very ill for any period of time, you know, the world just has to pass you by. Even if you've just had a bad flu for the few days, you just can't play. Life is there, but you're in bed. And so it's important to think about the fact that if you haven't got your health, you really haven't got anything, and it has to come first. No matter what revolution you're building, your health is there, and it's a critical thing before. Your health is there after and during. So it's, it's, it's really the first thing. You want to build a good army? Get some medics first. And sadly, as everybody sees these difficult things where we have all of this technology, we have all of this access, and somehow people aren't getting it. And the people in this room, I think, understand that better than most. We have so much that we can do so much with, and yet it's not doing what we hoped. Why not? Something's amiss. So some of these things that I'll talk about are very... Uh, I take examples from the United States where, of course... The system is one of the most abhorrent. Um, but these, these problems do exist across the board. How did we get here? Why, why did it end up that we have all this technology and we're not delivering it? Somehow there was this ordainment that we gave science. And don't get me wrong, I'm a scientist too, and I love it. But there's this faith that we have that it's the greatest thing and it will fix everything and that only those people who have letters after their name should really be trusted to talk about it. And this is why I love being in the hacker community because that floats a little bit and we can say, nah, if you understand, that's enough. So an example is a dental dams, latex for you know, having well-protected sex or safer sex have been... Um, controlled as a medical device in certain states in the U.S., which is ridiculous. You shouldn't need the permission of a doctor to have safe sex. And there are a million examples of this which are really frightening and, and bizarre. 
So looking at medical infrastructure, what have we got? Well, most of the institutions that are trying to keep people healthy are looking at a macroethical structure. They're saying, how do we keep the greatest number of people as healthy as we can with the resources which we're given? But we all know that that is not anything that a sick person cares about. If you come into the doctor and you say, listen, I'm dying, and they say, yeah, we know you're dying, but the structure that we have, most people aren't, so isn't that okay? No, it's not okay. Um, and so we need to think about things on a microethical scale as well. Now, when I was young and I, I first started having an idea about wanting to have an idea of autonomous health, this was the classic book that everybody said, where there is no doctor. This is a thing that will show you how you can build things on your own. And I bought it, and I was so excited, and I was so disappointed. Because this book specifically takes that macro approach, where they're saying, oh, show people how to utilize water sanitation, um, teach people the importance of putting out houses far from where food is prepared. And I said, this isn't what I wanted. I want to learn how to set bones with no tools. I want to know how to make medications on the fly. And that's not what it was about. Now, they weren't wrong, of course. But the interesting thing is, is that large-scale structural changes don't come from doctors. Doctors are the people you go to when that breaks down. The things that actually build health, this book is correct. It only happens on a communal level or on an individual level, when people take control of their own health, when people are invested in their own health. When that happens, then you start getting change. It doesn't happen at, at the institutional level. And I think most people who have had to interface with a hospital know that. In some cases, hospitals are very good. Yes, you shatter your arm and they need to put pins in your bones. Eh, hard to do at home. Um, but in terms of gross changes, those certainly don't happen in a doctor's office. And perhaps we can get to a point where the micro changes also happen at the individual level. Something to think about is that hospitals, statistically, at least in the United States, are the most dangerous place. You're most likely to die in a hospital, which is so bizarre. And I also know this firsthand because I almost died in the hospital. Um, and so the people who are keeping you safe are the people who are the least paid and the least valued. They're the people who are keeping things clean. If you've ever watched somebody make and change a bed in a hospital, it is a very, very particular process, and it's difficult to get right. And they, you know, they're, there's very specific procedure to make sure that you're not catching MRSA. It's hard to do. So we have to ask this question of, well, how would we like to approach health? What is the better way? And when you see medical institutions, most of the time what they're doing is the factory model. They're just trying to mitigate risk. They're trying to say, what is the least amount of money that we're going to lose on malpractice and stay in business? And there are very impolite things I want to say about that. <laughs> However, on the flip side, instead, we could have an artisan model. We could have this idea of saying, how do you take somebody who will take an interest in your health specifically, not say, oh, how can we keep the doors open? How can we keep things running? But specifically, how can we, how can we make you healthy? Wouldn't you like to come in and shake the doctor's hand, and he knows your first name, and he says, how have you been since we last chatted? I've been concerned about you, or calls you before you call her. That would be nice. Cancer is this classic, classic example. So many places are saying, we're using big data to cure cancer. They're not. They may be doing a really interesting big data problem, but it's not gonna cure cancer because cancer is not a big data problem. We're finding that out very, very clearly. That basically, if you get cancer, you're the first person to get that. Nobody's had your cancer because it's yours. And it's different than every other cancer that everybody's ever had before you. There's a wonderful um, institution called Cancer Commons um, in the US. It's run by a guy named Marty Tenenbaum. And what he does essentially is he has a research model that is small scale looping. And what he's able to do is take people who are not responding to traditional cancer treatments and take experimental therapies that have not been used on anybody and tailor them specifically for you. 
It's brilliant. And this guy has saved so many lives. And the interesting thing is that tailoring problem, that artisan problem can be applied to everything. And it should be because your body isn't like everybody else's. Your gut microbiome is different than everybody else's. Your DNA is different than everybody else's. The way you eat and breathe and walk and speak is different. And those things affect your health, every single part of it. Now, why do we still go to the doctor then? Well, the traditional answer is, well, the doctor is the expert, but that's not why. The reason is, is going back to smuggler's model, uh, if you don't, you're breaking the law. In, in the state of New York where I lived for some time, if somebody says to me, you know, I have a headache, and I said, have you thought about taking an aspirin for that? That is a felony, and I am practicing medicine without a license, um, punishable by up to a quarter million dollar fine and five to seven years in prison. Now, it's not usually prosecuted that way, but that's how blanket the laws are. And so instead, if somebody, if you go to a doctor and they actually fix you, you think you should be grateful. But what really happened was you were disallowed the access to do it yourself, and then you were forced to go somewhere where you had to pay for it to get sold back to you. And that's what happened. Now, there's a bigger issue at play. And I think many of you know it, but we're dealing with information control. And we have to talk about how human rights fit into that. And what, what makes a human right? How do you figure human rights? And again, this comes back to talking about definitions. What makes us human? Well, how do you define human rights? It has to start with the human body and the human mind. And so the two things that have to come first are first, that you should be able to inquire in any way that you see fit, and you should be able to do whatever you want to your body in whatever way you see fit. And interestingly enough, in the United States, both of those things are massively illegal. Oftentimes I go up on stage and I violate the Atomic Secrets Act by doing one math problem, which is punishable by death in the United States. When you look at what makes a right essential, it's one of those things. What what disallows you from every other thing? And again, inquiry, bodily autonomy, these things have to come first because without those, nothing else is possible. Now going back to the idea of all these institutions that we're sort of born into, that we're sort of forced to take part in because it doesn't seem like there are options. Oftentimes when I give talks to less enlightened people, I, I get these protestations where people say, oh, but you're not an expert. How can you do that? And you have to remember that anything, anything, any discovery was done by one person alone in some lab for the first time. It was done first. Every, everything was DIY first because there wasn't an institution. Just because the institution has been around longer than we can remember doesn't mean that there wasn't somebody who tried something first. This is the most critical point, I think. And given that crypto anarchy is sort of the point where economics and morality are colliding really hard, uh, this will resonate with a lot of you. Throughout history, there have been times when economics and morality have come to an impasse. Those who have been coming from a moral space have said, what's occurring is not okay. And those who are defending the status quo have said, yes, we understand that it's very unfortunate, but this is the way our economy works, and so we just have to live with it. And the response comes, well, that's not good enough. Classical examples, of course, of the Reformation, the Cold War. In the United States, a classic example is slavery. People were saying, people can't be property. And many people said, yeah, you know, that's weird, and it's sort of an old idea, but it's what our economy is based on, so we just have to deal with it. And many people said, well, that's just not good enough. And I think that's happening now again, specifically with intellectual property. The idea of saying, ideas can't be property. They belong to humanity. We're all in this together. And people are saying, well, yes, you know, it's kind of strange and it is based on 100-year-old ideas, but what we're really working for here is, is, is just trying to stabilize the economy. Um, and there are some of us who are saying, well, that's 
just not good enough. So we want intellectual property to be free. We want to be able to trade ideas. We want to look at things and, and, and ask these essential questions, the things that give rise to so many of the ideas that I've seen um, this weekend when people say, yeah, well, it's always been that way, but why? Why not something else? When we look at this, the question I often ask is, if someone were dying and you knew how to save them, would you ever refuse to tell them how and say, that's my idea and I'm not going to share? Nobody would. And yet, being complicit in the structure of intellectual property law that disallows people access from medical technologies that could otherwise save them, uh, we're part of the problem. Again, another thing that I get often when I am talking about teaching people how to make their own drugs or make their own medical devices is they say, oh, you really shouldn't show people how to do that. They'll get it wrong, and then they'll hurt themselves. Is that better than not telling them? Um, is, is not telling them really better? Because then, then what happens is they just die because they don't have access to the thing. Take your pick. And a very specific example of this, I, I know this is a low-res photograph, I couldn't get a better one, but this book is a story of a bunch of drug addicts in Northern California, right near where I live, quite some time ago, who developed Parkinson's-like effects over a course of a few days. Parkinson's usually takes decades, or at least years. And what they had found was that there was a, an a poorly manufactured opiate. A guy had cut a corner, he had had a side reaction, and there was this toxic byproduct that had caused all of these addicts to suddenly go into full body paralysis. And people often say, see, this sort of thing will happen. Well, guess what? The reason this happened was because, and this was found out by the authors of this book who went back and did the research, the pages in the journal that had the information on how to manufacture the opiate that he was trying to manufacture, part of that had been cut out of the local library in hopes that it would mislead the people who were manufacturing the opiates. Well, it did, and that's what occurred. So, can you make your own medicine? Of course you can. It's been done since time immemorial. The first people who made medicine made their own medicine. And again, is it okay? It has to be. It has to be. Because if you tell me I don't have the freedom to save my own life, that's capital punishment by proxy. Furthermore, when you offer a tool and you say, here, look, now everybody has access and this isn't just something that's relegated to labs and factories far and away, new things are going to come up. People are going to discover things that we never thought of before. And as that information flows more freely, we will all be healthier. Now again, the rhetoric here that's important to remember is, let's assume for a moment that it actually is dangerous. You have to have the personal choice first, and second, even if it were risky, which is more risky, shrugging and just waiting to die because you're sick, or trying something experimental? You're already dying. Is it really going to be worse? The, that, that argument doesn't hold water. It's the same way where people are saying, oh, vaccinations might be risky. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to utilize them for my child. Well, I mean, even if they are, which is more risky? Again, it's saying, when was this bridge last tested? I'm not sure if it's up to spec. I'm gonna swim through the toxic river. It doesn't make sense. It is important to recognize that living life is about mitigating risk, and we have that. And we should all have the freedom to decide which we think is the better part of valor. Now, um, this is a recent stencil by Banksy, and I think it really illustrates things well. Basically, you know, again, when you're when the medical infrastructure actually works, it appears to work because you've been fixed. But you've been fixed 
only because you were disallowed from fixing it yourself. We have to do something because if we don't, we're taking part in that thing that's keeping everybody ill. So, to give a little bit of specifics, I've been just told I have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna give some of the technical details here. Um, if you have heard about us, it was probably through this, when the uh, Mylan jacked up the price of the EpiPen. We produced the Epi Pencil, which is made from off-the-shelf parts for $30. You can reload it for about $3, and you can test it. And the interesting thing about this is, oh, right, our YouTube a video on how to do it was taken down because we were endangering the public. However, it's uh, still hosted on our website. Um, you can also get it on uh, Alexandria Project and the Internet Archive. Here's the interesting thing. Oh, right. And the FDA said, yeah, you shouldn't make your own EpiPen, which was hilarious because the interesting thing was they started to fail and 80,000 of them were recalled. Um, and then after they were recalled, they didn't investigate why they why they were failing. Interesting thing, it's a single-use tool, so you can't test it until you use it. I heard a horrible story about some guy who had to watch his daughter die on an airplane because two of them failed in a row. It was just terrible. And then on top of that, once they recall happened, even with the price hike, they still couldn't get them because there was a shortage. And the price didn't go down, and that was, that was almost two years ago. And here's Heather Bresch lying to Congress about it. Um, and if you want to call her, um, <laughs> tell her what you think. Um, uh, so again, this was the other thing that we did um, utilizing the Apothecary Micro Lab two and a half years ago. Um, this is Martin Shkreli who ran uh, Turing Pharmaceuticals being hauled away for... Uh, uh, his trade fraud. Um, this is me at the same time throwing pills of, you know, worth $750 a piece that I manufactured for a few cents to the crowd at Hackers on Planet Earth. Um, I called him at this number. Um, now, of course, you can't call him at that number anymore because he got seven years in prison, um, but you can write to him if you want uh, at this address. <sighs> um, I did. Um, he hasn't written back yet, but I'm, I'm still hoping to uh, get the dialogue started. So just a little bit more on the, on the technical side. This is the reactor, and without going into too much detail um, yet, uh, it's a jacketed reactor. You have the reaction in the inner chamber, and you have uh, an outer chamber that circulates fluid. You're able to stir and inject reagents. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero I'm sure you recognize. Here's the original breakout board that controlled it. Um, this is the new core that's a one piece uh, that's 3D printed and the nice guys at uh, uh, Prusa are printing one for me right now. Um, and I'm gonna leave it there. So if anybody wants it, you can just go pick it up or at least watch it printing, assuming it printed well. Um, this is sort of what it looks like, one jar inside the other. They screw together. Here I am just earlier in the cafe trying to print it myself. Um, I wasn't able to get it to take. Uh, which is why the pros are doing it. So here's the uh, schematic for the hardware. Um, this is an image uh, mock-up of the printed circuit board. Um, and here it is actually populated. Uh, here's one side with the relays that click things. Here's the other side with the ICs. And then um, the last thing where we might actually be crypto-anarchists because we are using a layer of cryptography is in this next project. So these are the five most expensive drugs ever. And they're on the market currently, except for the first one, I think, which is um, not available. But uh, without going into detail, each of these come from a biological source, which is interesting. And the thing about manufacturing drugs chemically is that you have to have the precursors, you have to put it together. It's a tricky business. But if you have something that's biological in nature, it mimics things in digital nature because you can get things to self-replicate if they're alive. Now, there's no question that even if you have the genetically modified versions of each of these biological cells, that extracting the medicine from them is quite a trick. However, being able to replicate them is not that hard. And so a database can be developed where we all have the raw materials 
And so, well, here, I should mention this is George Church who was saying some unfriendly things about those of us doing um, synthetic biology. And this is what I have to say to that. <laughs> so, those of us who are unafraid to do some synthetic biology without permission, this is our new platform. And we hope to share this. And the idea is, again, just like yogurt or sourdough starter or even seeds of a plant, if you have one, you can make more. Now, never again pay for a service that would be dirt cheap if it weren't run by a bunch of profiteering gluttons. So, how, however, do you get physical materials from point A to point B without being observed and without it being attributed to you? So, the technicalities of this I can't get into because of the time constraint. However, we're trying to build a cryptographic layer that lies over the US postal system, utilizing the coding system that the US Postal Service uses to get things from point A to point B. This way, I have a bacteria, I can make a copy of it, I can mail it through a series of nodes, and it will anonymous, more or less anonymously, very difficult to track, will get from point A to point B, and then somebody else will have a copy, and they can make as many copies as they want, and they can send them out. And the cryptographic layer will allow you to query and say, I know this is in the database somewhere, I'd like someone to send it to me, I'm not asking who it's coming from, and I'm not saying who I am. And it still can get to you. And these mailing envelopes, they nest very nicely. Looks kind of like the Tor network, right? So again, biological materials fall into these categories of bacteria, fungus, plants, or mammalian cells. Fungus grows very, very well on cellulose. You can just inject it into an old book. In the US, there's a special postal rate for books. It's called media mail. It used to be called um, book rate. But media mail now also allows you to send CDs. And I remember thinking, gosh, CD looks a lot like a, like a Petri dish. And so we've been streaking plays to try and see if they take. We're working on it. So last thing to mention, this is the most common infectious disease in human beings. This is Streptococcus mutans. It is a bacteria that lives on your teeth and it excretes lactic acid. This is what gives you cavities it has this unusual ability to cling to the surface of your tooth. And the lactic acid breaks down your tooth enamel, and then it allows other bacteria to come and set up shop. So, this is a guy, an American, of course. He's 17. These are his teeth. This could have been avoided because, guess what? If it's a bacteria, you could inoculate against it. There have been studies. The difficulty is, is that you get this very, very, very early. So if you're past a year in age, forget it. However, we did notice that, of course, there is strep, and you can genetically engineer it so that it will knock out the original bacteria and outcompete it. And then what you can do on top of that is take that and take out an open reading frame of the gene that says produce lactic acid and have it produce alcohol dehydrogenase instead, which does not damage your teeth. You take this, you brush your teeth with it once, no matter how old you are, and you never get another cavity for the rest of your life. But guess what? You can't get it because the FDA hasn't approved it and oh, it's genetically engineered, so it's somebody else's intellectual property. That said, we're hoping to give this to everybody. <laughs> so stay in touch. <laughs> we are very pleased with what we're doing, but we think that we're hopefully going to be just a footnote in a much larger picture. Um, <laughs> love this quote as I do, life finds a way. There's a little gap in his argument. We're life too, and we found a way. So, just to finish up, here's a picture of Earth from space. Helps not on the way. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I ended on time. Yeah, uh, I think it's question time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think I have, right? Yeah. We have enough? Okay, so firstly, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was one of, one of the most interesting presentations here, scientific one. Thank you. And I believe we will have a lot of questions. So, the first question. Well, cool. I'll... 
I'm excited to talk to everybody. And again, if, if you're not able to get your question in on time, I will be here the rest of the day. So if you just want to come chat with me, I'm going to go speak with uh, the guys at the radio booth after. Um, but but I'll, once I'm done with that, I'll be just around. So Hello. Hey. My name is Pontus, and uh, I have a PhD in molecular biology and genetics, but that's not my question. Uh, I think this is super fascinating, and you gave a brilliant talk. Thank you. Combining uh, med medicine with uh, open source is brilliant. And I think you have provided a moral argument, but not the ultimate justification in my opinion. So I want to give it a shot. Okay. Uh, first off, it is more profitable to treat symptoms while pretending to cure than to provide an actual cure. The economic incentives have been lacking to a large extent before crowdsourcing and actual free markets. But now for the ultimate justification in my mind. Intellectual property is just an artificial government-enforced monopoly on bits, in direct conflict with private property of atoms. All life, all evolution, all progress comes from copying and improving on previous designs. Yes, yeah, so I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, thank you. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that that's... Um, I think that's important to put forward, and, um, and in, in a crowd like this that is fairly enlightened on these things, I think that's pretty clear. Um, I don't usually force that particular issue, specifically because it takes so much um, back and forth to actually get to the grid of it, but I would agree, yeah. I mean, open, the, con the, the greater argument that you put forward for open source in all things, I, th I think, does apply, and, and it, there's no reason why medicine is exempt. So, so, yes, thank you for throwing that in. That's critical. And, and I hope the rest of the world recognize it. Please tell everyone, okay? <laughs> Questions? Hi. Anna Kozlova, uh, Science for Life Extension, Moscow, Russia. Um, I've got two questions. Um, first, how do you choose drugs to synthesize? And second, uh, are you planning to work on uh, any anti-aging drugs? Uh, okay, so the questions were which drugs do we pick, or how do we pick yeah, drugs, and, pick and are we doing anything with anti-aging? Yeah, are you going to? Yeah, okay. So um, the, the, the five or six drugs that we're working on, we've chosen specifically um, due to sort of the political conflict that they have, the lack of accessibility that people tend to have surrounding it, um, and plausibility of making it. So, for instance, uh, a lot of people write to us asking, are you going to do something about insulin? That's critical. Well, we'd love to, but you, it's, you can't really make insulin chemically. That's something that you have to do biologically. It's a macromolecule. It's much harder to make. Um, so the ones we've been working on are uh, naloxone, which reverses opioid overdose, um, Solvaldi, which is the hepatitis C cure, that actually drains the viral load so that you can eliminate it from your body permanently. Um, Mifepristone and misoprostol, which are the abortifacient drugs. Um, and uh, GSK744, which is going to be marketed under the name cabotegravir. It's a, it's a HIV antiretroviral and pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, all of these have problems. They're unavailable to most people because they're either very expensive or they're legally controlled or they, in the last case, they haven't been approved yet. Um, and they have tremendous potential for being able to increase the, you know, the health landscape. Um, now, in terms of anti-aging drugs, if one comes a along that seems to have great efficacy and people don't have access to it, like... Sure. And again, there's a whole host of things that people don't have access to that we'd like to work on. We're, you know, we're, we're very resource poor um, as a collective because we don't have any funding and all of our work is voluntary. That said, if you do have extra Bitcoin um, or any cryptocurrency, we have wallets online if you want to throw things in there. Um, so we can only work on a few at a time. Um, but if some amazing anti-aging drug comes along that only the rich can have or only people where it's legal can have, then yeah, we totally take a crack at it. If you find one, send it to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. So apparently there are a lot of very efficient drugs. Um, people like you um, 
can make. I have a question. So, if, is there a way how to buy this drug at uh, crypto markets now? I mean, these efficient cures. If you know, you, some you mean just ways to acquire drugs without manufacturing themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this, this stuff in a completely anonymous way using crypto markets. Um, Using bitcoins, Monero, yeah, or hidden um, services, you know what I mean. Right, Th there are trade-offs, there are ways that you can acquire drugs um, through various channels. Uh, the, the easiest is if, uh, if you're in Nepal or India or Bangladesh, or if you send away um, to Nepal or India or Bangladesh, usually you can get brand drugs for a fraction of the price. Um, sometimes they get seasoned customs, you can't order a lot of them at, at a time. Um, there are people who will send them to you, and there are, in certain cases, depending on the legal status of certain things, um, exemptions, depending on which country you live in, for allowing just a personal use uh, amount of various things. So that's, that's the most common way these days. Um, there are other ways you can sometimes get things through veterinary supply. Um, because often things are not controlled for animals the way they are for humans, but it's the same drugs um, because, you know, uh, mammals aren't that different um, in, in certain cases. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, other times things are just packaged differently. So if you're looking for a particular drug, if you can check what the active ingredient is, sometimes you can find it in other things and you can use it sort of off-label. Um, there's a, there, are, there are a couple of books out there, most of them are fairly antiquated, but there's one called uh, How to Buy Any Prescription Drug Without a Prescription Legally, or something like that. There are a few others, again, old information, but these are more or less the, the tactics that are used. Um. Uh, I have a suggestion to bridge the uh, previous panel and uh, sometimes going offshore with your uh, medical things and that's uh, what I've been doing. So, for example, I like to shop for vitamins in the US uh, because mm -hmm. they're much cheaper because we have socialized markets here. Right. And also, uh, I would suggest people if something is regulated in their country, it doesn't mean they cannot do it. They can right. fly to Mexico or somewhere else. So this is very common with psychedelics. So I suggest to avoid these barriers by you know moving your ass around the world. It's a nice planet. <laughs> But um, what I wanted to ask is, um, I see CRISPR, uh, the, the genetic modification, as a kind of a bridge between um, information technology, because it's basically yeah. information and uh, biology and medicine. So do you have any ideas about CRISPR, how it will be used? And Yeah, it's and cool. And there are other gene editing technologies that are out there that are, like, people like CRISPR because it's cheap and it's fast. There are other ones that are more robust, like zinc fingers and enzyme blockers. There are a few others, and we do now have a biology team um, working on some of these things. And there are a number of therapies that are incredibly powerful that will just wipe out leukemia by, take, by harvesting some of your cells, going through, doing a very complicated process, and then re-injecting them. Um, and utilizing some of these technologies Uh, it, like the, the lung cancer one is just mind blowing um, and you can get it in Cuba but guess what not in the US big surprise right um, now that said you can uh, it, it's tricky to extract and again it, the hard part of making these these sorts of technologies um, do it yourself is also the easy part because scaling down on a chemical is easier because if you're doing small-scale chemistry, it makes things more accurate. But sometimes it's more difficult when you're working with biological things. Like if you have to have like a column that's eight feet tall f to you know separate things, it's a bit of a trick. Not to say that it can't be done. Um, and so we're looking into those specifically because again, most of the most expensive treatments out there are all gene therapies. So. And again, as you say, that's something that you could theoretically just download, sequence, adjust as you see fit, and then... So, yeah. we're working on it. The leukemia 
thing, by the way, is the immunotherapy, the genetic immunotherapy. Right. It yeah. has been approved in the U.S., so you can get it now in the U.S. You don't oh, have to. Cool. It's wow. very expensive, but I, you yeah. can. But I just, what about... Um, I just I have to go back to my shithole country, and I, I, yeah. I, I don't even keep up on the news because it's so yeah. depressing. Yeah. So, uh, this one is not as depressing. <laughs> so. uh, but what about... Um, uh, not curing diseasing, uh, diseases, but you know, increase your intelligence or you know your productivity, yeah, your quality uh, of I life. Mean, and again, if there is something that has great efficacy that comes around, um, sh- sure, and it's not available, and you, you know, we'll we'll take a look at it. But right now, keeping f- people from dying is like step zero, and then then maybe we can get to like, oh, uh, let's you know, let's get strong and smart and you know, immortal. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like all of those things too. I want to be smart and strong and immortal. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> thank you for a great talk. Um, thank you. I'm in Toronto. There's a hack lab over there with a you know bio section. I guess I'm more on the IT side. But uh, w- what would you say when I go back home and I go talk to these guys and I say, "Wow, it's an amazing presentation." There's bio hack labs all around the world. Yeah. I'm not sure if you know how they collaborate or how they can connect with you. Uh, what kind of help do you need from those kind of organizations, or how can these organizations become effective members of your network? Yeah. So any um, any uh, biohacking lab should get in touch with us, if especially if they want to become a node of the BioTorrent network, and um, we'll set it up and we'll be able to send them um, bacteria material, especially with this very first one. The, um, we actually got our hands on the first generation of the mutated mouth bacteria that outcompetes the original. Um, it isn't edited to have the alcohol instead of the lactic acid. So any biohack lab who wants to take a crack at that, we will send them the raw material, which you can't get because it's intellectually controlled, um, the, you know, through the mail. And, and it's, it's stable at room temperature, so as long as it's, you know, we overnight it, it should be fine. Um, so, yeah, please get in touch. And there's more where that came from. So, yes, p- uh, please. And we have a contact page uh, on the website. If you want to get uh, involved personally, we can use the help on no matter what it is you do. We have hardware design and software design and um, encryption security, uh, uh, medicine, biology. Basically, if you have a skill or even no skills, we'd like your help. So (laughs) please throw in. Uh, I have a question. So is there any guide uh, guide, uh, that, for example, if I'm ill, if I have some really serious illness, uh, I can just find that you should travel to Cuba because in Cuba they have a special treatment for you. You know what I mean? Because most people, they are quite lost. They just expect treatment and drugs from the local government or maybe European or US government. So I'd like to ask you if it is, if it is some guide for these like serious, seriously ill people just to, okay, you should do this, visit this country, take this drug, you know. Right, so, like so how, do you, how do you pick your treatment if you have something in particular that's wrong? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we're, we just uh, published the first draft of a pamphlet on sort of managing your own health. And this is the most critical thing because you want to be able to figure out what's best to do first. You want to make sure that you understand what's wrong and also understand what will make it better. Um, the, the, the one skill that you have to acquire, which takes a little bit, but not a lot, is um, being able to read a scientific paper. Now, I imagine most people in this room don't have a problem with that, but for the average person, they sort of need to develop that skill. Um, And once you do, then you can sort of take the temperature of the current research, and as you read through papers, you can sort of see what looks experimental and what's established, and then you can sort of decide if there are certain tests that will determine which kind of whatever you have and what the best uh, thing for that is. In the UK, there's a public database on best practices that's revised every year, and that's um, that's publicly accessible. Um, there was one in the US until about two months ago um, that was maintained by the US government, but they decided it wasn't important, and so they just shut it down. Um, w- some wonderful people on the internet made backup copies, which you can find, they're tricky to find, but there are a few other um, examples of places where you can um, go and find sort of best practices from doctors. But again, what I encourage everybody to do if you come across some thing where you're trying to help somebody you care about who's ill or if you yourself are ill um, and you, you want to find the most optimal treatment is to look at the newest research. Um, 
with a skeptical eye, because oftentimes people publish just to publish, and you know what they've come up with was not working. You should see and see if it's done a few times, and then it's been established, and there have been good studies. Um, but that's what I do. Um, whenever somebody I care about is ill, or whenever I'm ill, I try and just read the papers that are out there, the most recent ones. Um, and yeah, it works. So that would be that on that. Sorry for the sudden change of moderator, but we can continue on. So uh, uh, another question here. Hi, thank you a lot for your, for your talk. Thank I was you. actually interested if you guys are covering plants, because plants are, can also cure many diseases. And I'm, I'm sorry. The plants. Plants, Herbs, yes, yes. So, um, so this is something that we haven't dug into because um, herbalism is pretty well established and you don't need much in the way of technology of it. Uh, we've had a lot of herbalists contact us and say, hey, we have a thing and um, cool, but you don't need our stuff for that, right? What's one of the things that's kind of um, magical about plant-based cures is that you don't need much besides like the plant maybe water or alcohol, you know, some heat, and then you can sort of extract and filter. Um, you know, a great example is aspirin, right? You can e extract that from willow bark. You, you get uh, salicylic acid, and you can break it down to acetyl salicylic acid, and, and you, you have aspirin. Um, and so anything that you can extract from a plant material, um, you should just extract from a plant material. Uh, totally doable. Um, yeah, and, and, and there are, you know... Um, so looking at abortion, there are a lot of abortifacient drugs that will in, induce miscarriage. And you can just take them if you, if you know how, and you don't make it too toxic, but you can, you can sort of shock your body uh, into miscarrying. Um, and there are lots of examples of plant-based things that do work. Um, and those you don't get from research papers as much. Those you have to sort of find through the old folk medicine rather than the new. Um, but the information is out there. Those are better found in books if you're looking for that sort of thing. There is a really great uh, book that's revised every so often called Prescription for Nutritional Healing. It talks about ways that you can take vitamin supplements, herbs, uh, adjust your diet and lifestyle, and often cure you know, common diseases. It's thick, and there's a lot of information in there. And it, they cite their sources pretty well, so at the very least, if you're interested in something that they mention that's plant-based, you can go back and read the original research. So yeah, um, but thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, uh, if anyone has a question, I can pass the mic. I have one. Uh, are you part of a biohacker space or any like open source uh, hacker space that... Uh, so, I mean, I'm friends with a lot of biohacking spaces. The interesting thing is that until we started doing biological stuff recently, we didn't really overlap with biohacking very much. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I know if you, if you need to go to a next one, it's cool. Um, uh, and they're doing really great work um, in terms of where I am locally in the Bay Area in California. Counterculture Labs is there. The Open Insulin Project is there. BioCurious is there. Um, the Odin is there. Um, and they're all people that are doing great work. Um, so if you're looking for biohacking spaces in that area, um, and, and basically if you look, if you live in any major city, there's, there's going to be a biohacking space. Anyway, it looks like yes. we're out of time. Uh, yes. But Thank I'll be around if anybody wants to hang out and chat. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a really great talk. Thank, Thank you all you. so much.